Hello and welcome to St Peter Mancroft. To those of you here and those of you watching online, I'm Fiona Howarth, the Associate Priest. This is part of our series of live streamed reflections from Mancroft. And if you're visiting the church, please do feel free to continue looking around. Last week, I attended a moving online service with the Iona community. It was two days before the anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands from German occupation during the Second World War, which takes place on the 5th of May, three days before we mark VE Day in the UK. The Dutch mark their liberation by lighting candles on the 4th of May and remembering all those who died. The following day is a public holiday with parades of veterans and music festivals taking place in much of the country. The service was planned and led by four members and associates of the Iona community. Two are Dutch and two are German. Memories were shared from childhood by a Dutch member who recalled a family holiday in France in the 1970s when her father had to produce his Dutch passport to prove that they were not German in order to be served in a cafe. A German member told a story of her father who returned often to a childhood memory of a school outing on which they passed a large group of Jewish people of all ages waiting at the station to be deported. A girl in his class asked the teacher, but aren't they human like us? To which the teacher responded with a harsh no and moved them quickly on. Together, the leaders spoke of their memories of difficult encounters with relatives from the opposing side in the war. The years that it took to move beyond the vast divisions left by war. I was struck by a comment made by one of the Dutch members. Peace is a contract. Reconciliation is a much harder task. The signing of a peace agreement may end fighting, but the damage done by long years of war, of occupation, oppression, brutality and fear are not solved by signatures on a document. A peace can be enforced, peacekeepers can be deployed, but if a peace agreement is little more than an end to hostilities, and the underlying damage is left unaddressed, simmering beneath the surface. Tensions may erupt again, prompting a further descent into violence and conflict. Peace is a contract. Reconciliation is a much harder task. The word reconcile is from the Latin, reconciliare, meaning to bring together to restore to union and friendship after estrangement or variance. It is a word with a deep theological context, speaking of the work of God in Christ in restoring the relationship between God and humanity. Reconciliation is the end of the estrangement between God and fallen, broken human beings. As those who have benefited from this work of reconciliation, Christians are called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. Paul wrote in the second letter to the Corinthians, all this is from God, who reconciled us to God's self through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Out of this understanding of reconciliation between God and humanity has grown a strand of reconciliation theology 
which seeks to apply the theology of reconciliation in political settings. This means to take seriously the need for justice, truth, forgiveness and repentance. Much of the work in this area has been developed by John W. de Grouchy, a Christian theologian known for his work resisting apartheid in South Africa. De Grouchy suggests that there are four interrelated aspects of reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and humanity and what this comes to mean in terms of social relations. Interpersonal ways of reconciliation between individuals. The meaning of reconciliation between alienated communities and groups at a local level. And political usage of reconciliation, such as the process of national reconciliation. Perhaps the best known outworking of a theology of reconciliation is that of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, established as one of the first political acts in post-apartheid South Africa, authorised by Nelson Mandela and chaired by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a court-like body which was established to offer restorative justice as opposed to retributive justice in which wrongdoers are punished in proportion to the severity of their crime. The Nuremberg trials following the Second World War used a retributive approach. Restorative justice, in contrast, is built on the practice of bringing those who have been wronged together with those who are responsible in order to confront the harm done and decide how it can be set right. The mandate of the Commission was to bear witness to, record, and in some cases grant amnesty to the perpetrators of crimes relating to human rights violations, as well as offering reparation and rehabilitation to the victims. A register of reconciliation was established so that ordinary South Africans who wished to express regret for past failures could express their remorse. For many of the victims who spoke, the opportunity to publicly share their stories and bring the truth of their experiences into the light and to be believed was a powerful moment and a significant step towards healing. The novel, Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton, was published in 1948 before apartheid was formalized in law. It tells the story of a black village priest seeking his missing son. He discovers that his son has murdered the son of a white landowner, and eventually the two fathers meet and become reconciled. Early in the book, a black priest helping to find the missing son says this, but there is only one thing that has power completely, and that is love. Because when a man loves, he seeks no power and therefore he has power. I see only one hope for our country, and that is when white men and black men, desiring neither power nor money, but desiring only the good of their country, come together to work for it. He was grave and silent, and then he said somberly, I have one great fear in my heart, that one day, when they are turned to loving, they will find that we are turned to hating. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been seen by many as a crucial component 
of the transition to full and free democracy in South Africa. Despite some flaws, it is generally, although not universally, thought to have been successful, enabling the country to move beyond its past of oppression and apartheid to democracy without the hatred, violence and bloodshed that was feared inevitable. In 2008, some 10 years after the conclusion of the Truth and Reconciliation hearings, Desmond Tutu wrote, We are now living in the day we longed for. It is not a cloudless day. The divine arc that bends towards a truly just and whole society has not yet fully stretched across my country's sky like a rainbow of peace. It is not finished. It does not always live up to its promise. It is not perfect. But it is new. A brand new thing, like a dream of God, has come about to replace the old story of mutual hatred and oppression. The model established by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been applied to other conflicts around the world. Similar hearings have taken place in Northern Ireland. As we hear the stories of the atrocities committed in Ukraine at present and in other conflicts that have fallen from our view, the theology of reconciliation offers us a model of how people might be enabled to move beyond the horrors they have experienced, to bring the stories of horror and violence into the light, to have their stories acknowledged as truth, and to enable the perpetrators to accept, accept responsibility for their wrongdoing, and so move towards reconciliation. Reconciliation is a costly path that demands a great deal of people. But costly as it is, all our efforts should bend towards achieving it. Loving God, in Jesus you have reconciled fallen, broken humanity to yourself. May we, in our turn, become agents of reconciliation, seeking always what is good and true and loving. May we dream your dream of peace and bend our lives to its establishment here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.